The challenges of legacy data warehouses and traditional business intelligence systems, they've been well documented. They're built on rigid infrastructure and they're managed by really specialized gatekeepers. Data warehouses in the past were, as one financial customer once said to me, like a snake swallowing basketball, right? Imagine that. The amount of data ingested into a data warehouse, it just overwhelmed the system. Every time Intel came out with a new microprocessor, practitioners, they would chase the chip in an effort to try to compress the overly restrictive elapsed time to insights. And this cycle repeated itself for decades. Cloud data warehouses generally, and Snowflake specifically changed all this. Not only were resources virtually infinite, but the ability to separate compute from storage and actually turn off the compute when you weren't using it, it permanently altered the cost, the performance, the scale, and the value equation. But as data makes its way into the cloud and is increasingly democratized as a shared resource across clouds and at the edge, practitioners have to bring sec DevOps mindsets to securing their cloud data warehouses. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we take a closer look at the fundamentals of securing Snowflake and to do so, we welcome two guests into the program. Ben Hersberg is an experienced hacker and developer and an expert in several aspects of data security. He's currently working as the chief data scientist at Satori and he's joined by his colleague, Yoav Cohen, who is a technology visionary and currently serving as CTO at Satori Cyber. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE, great to see you. Great to be here. Now these two individuals have co-authored a book on Snowflake security. It's a comprehensive guide to what you need to know as a, as a data practitioner using Snowflake. So guys, congratulations on, on the book. It's, it's really detailed, uh, packed with great information, best practices and practical advice and insights all in one place. So really good work. But so before we get into the discussion, I want to share some ETR survey data just to set the, the context. We're seeing cybersecurity and data, they're colliding in a really important way. And, and here's some data points that we've shared before from ETR's latest drill down survey. They asked more than 1200 respondents, we're talking CIOs, CISOs and IT professionals, which organizational priorities will be most important in 2022? And these were the top seven. And there were a lot of others, but these were the most important. So it's no surprise that security is number one, although as we shared in our predictions post, the magnitude of its relative importance, it does vary by the degree of expertise within the organization. The Delta is maybe not as significant, for example, in large companies. And you can see where analytics and data fit. And we've tied these two domains together and, and picked up on a term that our two guests have used. In fact, you guys may have even coined it called data SecOps, which to me is the idea that you bring agile DevOps practices to data operations and built in security as part of the full cycle of managing or the creating the data, using the data, accessing the data, not a bolt on, but it's, it's fundamental. So guys, what do you make of this data and what's your point of view on data SecOps? So definitely aligns with what we're seeing um, on the ground in, in the market. Uh, in between what you saw there, you had uh, cybersecurity and data warehousing. In the middle, you had cloud migration. And that's basically what's pushing um, um, companies to invest in both security and data and warehousing because the cloud uh, changed the game for cybersecurity. The tools that we used before are not the same tools that we need to use now. And also it unlocks um, a lot of performance value and capabilities around data warehousing. So all of that comes together to a big trend in the industry for investment for replacement. And definitely we're seeing that um, on the Snowflake platform, which is doing really, really well uh, um, uh, recently. Yeah, well, thank you, Yov. And to that point, you know, I want to share another data point and, and then dive in, maybe Ben, you can comment. And I want to address, why are we always talking about Snowflake? Of course, it's a hot company. Everybody knows that. You can see it in the, in the company's financials. But the East ETR survey data tells a really compelling story about the company. There's a chart from the most recent ETR January survey. Um, and so you can see at the, at the top, that blue line, it represents net score or spending momentum. And the darker line at the bottom represents presence or pervasiveness in the, in the survey sample. Just some background, there are 165 Snowflake customers that responded to this past survey. 10% of companies within the Fortune 500 
were in the sample and around 4% of global 2000 companies participated. Just under 30% of the respondents were C-suite executives and about 20% were analysts or engineers or data specialists with around half were VP, director, manager roles, that fat middle with a very broad mix of industries and there was a bias toward larger companies. Now, back to the chart, net score for a moment that is that top line. It's derived by asking, asking customers, are you adopting Snowflake new in 2022? That's the 27% lime green number. Will you be spending 6% or more on Snowflake relative to 2021? That's the 57% forest green. Is your spending flat? That's the gray. Is it down by 6% or worse? That's, that's the, 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 the other, um, uh, the, the pink area. Are you leaving the platform? That's the bright red and that's a zero defection. So there's, there's none there. So you subtract the reds from the greens and you get net score, which calculates out to 83% in this past survey. But what's remarkable is that Snowflake <laughs> has held this elevated score for more than 12 quarterly surveys. It's in the stratosphere among the many thousands and thousands of customer uh, companies in the ETR survey. Remember, anything above that 40% line is elevated and Snowflake is like glued to the ceiling. So the bottom line shows that the company's market presence continues to grow. That, that, that darker line at the bottom, that green shade is that the pace of last quarter is actually accelerating. Snowflake is becoming ubiquitous and customers are, are becoming intimately familiar with its platform and it's scaling like we've never seen before. And it's building a pretty hard to penetrate fortress, we think, in an ecosystem. Ben, I wonder, in your view, what accounts for Snowflake's performance? Okay, so I would say that uh, we can spend an, uh, you know, a full session just about uh, uh, such things. So I'll try to say what I think. I think, first of all, it does what it says on the box. It's uh, you get from zero to, uh, to being able to have a, a data warehouse um, uh, easily, uh, you have a, a very rich uh, support of, uh, of uh, capability and features that you need for a, a cloud data warehouse. Uh, you're multi-cloud, you, you, you're not dependent on one of the uh, big uh, public clouds. Um, and and uh, it's fast and scalable and you don't need to worry yourself with the infrastructure behind. You don't need to uh, God forbid, add any indexes or uh, or uh, or do do things like that. You you don't need to do that uh, at least um, not often. Uh, indexes never, but you know other uh, ma maintenance and uh, the innovation rate. Uh, they innovate fast. Uh, they add a lot of new capabilities, like the move to unstructured data, uh, like a lot of security and governance uh, capabilities high innovation rate uh, right. as well. Okay, good. And we'll talk about that move. So let's get deeper into the topic now on, on, on securing Snowflake. My first question is, look, Snowflake, when you talk to, to practitioners and customers, they get pretty high marks on security, largely because of the simplicity. So why did you feel the need to write a book on the subject? So um, definitely Snowflake is investing a lot of uh, effort and putting a lot of emphasis on, on security. However, Snowflake is a cloud service and like any other cloud service, there's a shared responsibility model between um, Snowflake and its customers when it comes to fully securing their data cloud. Um, so Snowflake can build amazing features, but then customers have to really adopt them, uh, implement them in, in the best way. One of the things that uh, we've seen by working with Snowflake customers is that we, typically interact with data engineers, but then they have to implement security features and security capabilities. We thought writing a book um, about the topic would help these customers to understand the features better, benefit from them better, and really structure their implementation and decide what's most important to implement at every step of their, of their journey. Yeah, and I think that, you know, when I was researching this topic, I. I could find a lot of good information on the web, but I kind of had to hunt and peck for it. It was really sort of dispersed and you put the information all in one place. You have a nice table of contents so I can just zip right to, to where I want to go. So that's, that was quite useful, I thought. Um, 
What are the very basic fundamentals of securing Snowflake? In other words, I'm interested in, you get this world of flexible, it's globally distributed, you get democratizing data. How do you really make sure that only those folks that should have access do have access? I mean, really, let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, I think that, the, um, of course, there are a lot of different aspects, but I think that the, I would start with uh, uh, the, the big blocks. For example, when you get a Snowflake account out of, out of the box, it's open to the world in terms of network. I would start by limiting that. That should be that should be easy for an organization. It's a couple of commands, and uh, and you've lowered your risk uh, significantly, uh, both security and compliance. Um, then uh, one of the common things that you can uh, get a good improvement in a, a decrease of your risk is uh, around authentication. For example, do you have applications that are accessing Snowflake using user password? Okay, change that to using a, a key. Uh, do you have users uh, with, uh, with, with username password? Change that to... Uh, uh, Okta integration of or your uh, IDP integration. So I would start with the big blocks that can remove most of my risk. And then, of course, there is a lot to do uh, from, you know, from getting to the to the data warehouse and to uh, uh, auditing and monitoring. Okay, thank you for that. But you have, are, how are these fundamentals uh, that we just heard from Ben, how are they different? Isn't this just kind of common sense, what's what's unique about Snowflake? So a couple of things. Um, first of all, you know, uh, security, we, we like to say that it's 80% like good security hygiene. You have to make sure that your basics are are, 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 are locked and, and, and tightly configured. And, and that that brings a lot of value. But two points to, to consider, first of all, um, all of these types of controls are pretty static in the sense that once you get in, you get in, and then you have pretty pretty broad access. And we'll talk about authorization concepts and, and everything perhaps today, but um, these are really static um, um, gatekeepers around your data. Once you have access, then it's, it's, free, it's, it's free for all. Um, when you compare it to other types of environments and what we're seeing in other domains, Maybe a move to more dynamic type of controls, elevated access or elevated um, additional authentication steps before you get elevated access. And what we're thinking is that beyond uh, the, those static controls, the market is going to move towards implementing more dynamic, more fine grain control, um, especially because um, in Snowflake, but any other data warehouse or large scale data store, which becomes an aggregation point of data in the company. And we work with really big companies and they bring in data from multiple jurisdictions from across the world so they can get like an overview of the business and, and, and run the business in a much more efficient way. But that really creates uh, a pressure point when it comes to securing, securing that data. Okay, Ben, you touched on this a little bit. Um, and I want to kind of dig deeper because so, Snowflake takes a layered approach, of course, that's it's sensible. And, and the layers, you know, network, which you talked about, identity, access, and, and encryption. And so, and with, with any cloud, as you guys, you know, mentioned, it's a shared responsibility model. So I want to break that down a bit and let's start with the network. So my responsibility as a customer, I'm going to be responsible to set up the DNS, I, I, you know, how much it, public internet access am I going to have for other users and apps? So how should practitioners think about their end of the bargain on the network? What, what do they need to know? At the network level, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a new account uh, is open, uh, network-wise it's open to the world. Uh, and the first, uh, the, one of the first things I would do would be to set a network policy uh, on the account to limit, uh, to limit network access uh, to to that account, and of course, in many organizations, you would want to configure that with private link uh, to your uh, cloud environment. Um, but that would be step two. <laughs> First step is uh, uh, simply set a network policy to make sure that it's not open to the public. Yeah, and, and that seems pretty straightforward. 
But, but, but let's talk about identity, because it, 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 it feels like that's where it starts to get tricky. You got to worry about setting up roles and, and managing users. It, you could even, you can configure row and, and column based access, as I understand it. And I imagine access is where it really gets, you know, kind of confusing for a lot of people, especially when you're crossing domain identities. Like, for example, isn't uh, role based security, let's, let's land on that for a minute. I think you called it hierarchy hell in the book. So, so what should we think about is in regards to identity? Well, first of all, it's hierarchy hell. It's, uh, you know, you should, uh, you, in the book it says that you can use hierarchy, but you should avoid uh, getting to a hierarchy hell. Um, <laughs> basically, we've seen that with, uh, with uh, several uh, Snowflake customers where uh, the ability to set roles in a hierarchy model uh, to set a role that inherits uh, privileges from another role that inherits privileges from other roles, um, maybe of course used in a good way, but it also some some in some of the cases it leads to complexities and uh, to uh, access not being deterministic, at least not uh, obvious to the person who gives access, uh, who is usually uh, the data engineer. So whenever you start having a complex uh, authorization model, whenever uh, I want to give Yoav access to a, a certain data set, and because things are complex, I also, by mistake, give him access to uh, the salary uh, information of the company, uh, that's when things become tricky. If, uh, if your roles are messy and complex, uh, then uh, it may lead to data exposure within the organization or outside the organization. How do you find Snowflake's integrations? Like if I want to use Okta or I want to use a CyberArk, I mean, how, how, how would you grade them on their ability to integrate with you know, popular third party uh, uh, platforms? So I would say pretty high. Actually, uh, we haven't encountered many customers who haven't configured any of these um, Nowadays, pretty basic uh, security integration, and it really, really helps. Um, you know, setting that good um, identity management foundation for for the platform. So they're investing a lot in that area. We've been following them for a couple of years now, and it's really, really coming along uh, nicely. All right, let's talk about encryption. I mean, that seemed pretty straightforward, right? If you correct me if I'm wrong, I think Snowflake Auto rotates the keys every 30 days. So you, it really seems like your responsibility there is monitoring making sure you're in compliance, you got good log data or access to good log data, it, it, is that right? So, so this, this really depends. So for the average company, uh, I would say yes. Uh, for some of the companies with higher uh, security requirements or compliance requirements or both, uh, sometimes there are uh, issues like um, you, you companies that do not want to have the data uh, stored in uh, in clear text in Snowflake, even encrypted as in the data warehouse encryption or the account encryption, uh, even if someone accidentally gets access to the table, uh, they want they want them not to be able to pull the data in clear text, and then it gets slightly more complicated. You you have different ways of of tackling this. But for the average uh, uh, company or companies who do not have such requirements, um, then um, everything in Snowflake is encrypted in transit and uh, at rest. And, and right. of course there are more advanced features for, you know, for higher requirements. Okay, I, I'm interested in what you guys think are some of the more vulnerable aspects uh, uh, that Snowflake customers should really be aware of. Ima imagine I'm, I'm saying, guys, you know, let's, let's run a pen test. You know, <laughs> make sure, yeah, okay, make sure I have no open chest wounds, but really try to, try to, try to fool me. Um, what would you attack? Where, where should I be extra cautious? So I would I would start with um, where where data data resides, um, and you know if you look at the Snowflake architecture, there's a separation between um, storage and compute, but that also means 
storage is uh, accessible um, without uh, going through the compute. Um, that can create um, um, opportunities for, for hackers to go and try and find access where access shouldn't be um, um, had. Um, that's, that's where I would, I would focus on. Great. I want to ask you about uh, virtual pri private Snowflake. I mean, it seems to me if I, if I'm have sensitive data, if, if I don't use virtual private Snowflake, I feel like I'm increasing my risk that a security uh, incident at the shared cloud services layer could impact multiple customers. And, and, and is this a valid concern? How should we think about you know, reducing that risk? And when should I use that higher level of, of security? So I think, uh, first of all, um, to the best of uh, my knowledge, I'm not a Snowflake employee, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, virtual private Snowflake is used by a uh, minority of the customers, uh, a small minority of the customers. Um, there are other uh, more popular uh, ways within Snowflake, like private link, for example, uh, to, uh, I would say, uh, to enhance your security and uh, and your account segregation, um, but I wouldn't say that uh, simply because a, a, a platform is multi-tenant, uh, it is vulnerable. Of course, uh, in many cases, your security or compliance requirements requires you to to eliminate even this risk, but I, I wouldn't say that uh, there are a lot of other platforms in different areas that are multi-tenant and... Uh, and probably better than your on-prem, your your average on-prem uh, installation. Okay, <laughs> so I buy that. So. I, 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 I would ahead. say on that, that maybe, you know, a shared environment is a, is a higher value target for, for, for hackers. So if you're on a shared environment with thousands of other customers, it's, it's, you know, if I'm a hacker, I would go there because then I get data for thousands of customers instead of trying to focus on just one target and um, getting, va getting data for just one company. Uh, I think that's the most uh, significant uh, advantage and obviously, you know, Snowflake um, are investing a lot in making all of their environment very, very secure. And we've, from our interactions with large Snowflake customers, we know that Snowflake are going above and beyond in making sure that these environments are secure. Yeah, that's good. That's good news because you know if I don't have to spend up, you know, I could I could put the put the budget elsewhere. H how do you guys think Snowflake's recent moves? Is it, they're making a couple of big moves. They've recently, you know, added unstructured data. They used to have semi-structured data. Um, they're going after the sort of data science and, and data lake functionality. Does that, do those kinds of moves, I guess they're two different things, but do that, does that change the way that uh, security pros should think about protecting their Snowflake environments? I would say that the Snowflake is uh, moving fast with adding new functionality. Well, fast, but not too fast. Uh, uh, they're releasing it uh, in a controlled way. Um, I would say that for uh, new capabilities, of course, in some cases there are new uh, attack vectors or new risks, uh, and um, and uh, obviously securing different types of data may bring new challenges. But the basics, I think, uh, remains the same: the basics of uh, network identity, authentication, authorization, auditing, monitoring. I would. Say they, 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 they will be the same and perhaps you know new new features or capability will need to be uh, used and the the largest issue is uh, as the data democratization is growing within organizations and more and more people are using uh, your uh, your data cloud uh, that that also needs to be addressed yep. yeah, yeah. All right, finally, I want to end, I want to talk a little bit about futures. Uh, you guys talked in your book about multi-cloud as a way to reduce your reliance on a single vendor. And, and you know, of course it happens through M&A and, and that's cool. Uh, we've talked a lot about multi-cloud uh, and, and, and we've been using this, this term that we coined called super cloud. And it's a references an abstraction layer that ex exists on top of and floats across, if you will, multiple clouds and it hides some of that underlying complexity. And we feel like Snowflake is a good example 
of a company that's moving in that direction, building value on top of all that hyperscale infrastructure. So I wonder if how you see Snowflake's moves in that direction uh, would impact the way you think about uh, data SecOps. So definitely we, we also see the trend of, of companies adopting um, more and more types of cloud and cloud technologies. Um, they're in one cloud today, they want to move to a second one. Almost every company that I talk to have now nowadays a multi-cloud strategy. Um, with respect to Snowflake, they basically have it figured out because they are an overlay, like a super cloud, um, super data cloud. Uh, that is uh, spread across any 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 cloud, and you can basically pick and choose the you know where where you want to put your data for what use cases, and that's really really helpful because then you don't have to manage uh, the complexity of multiple solutions um, for multiple um, areas of the business. We see this also in other areas where companies are saying, hey. Um, I prefer to not use a specific cloud technology for that purpose, but take um, use a vendor that can cover my needs across across the clouds. Definitely on the security side, where they want they want one throw to choke, so to speak, uh, but they want to control things on a central place. Um, as Ben mentioned before, complexity is the enemy of security, and having those multi-cloud operations from a security perspective definitely adds complexity, which adds risk. So simplifying that is, is really, really helpful. Hey, hey, thank you for that. And, and thank you guys for coming on today. Why don't you give us a little uh, a bumper sticker on, on Satori. What, what do you guys, what do you guys do? Give us the, the quick commercial. So um, we help companies um, secure access to their data on platforms like Snowflake and, and others. Uh, we build really um, innovative technology that decouples security controls from the actual data layer. So if you think about it, where you can put controls to um, govern how people access data, you can put it inside the database, you can put it somewhere on the client. We've actually invented uh, a technology that can do that in the middle. So you don't have to um, coalesce and, and, and mix your security concern, uh, concerns with your data. You don't have to go to your um, clients, users, endpoints, laptops, and put technology there. It's a technology that sits in the middle, decouples that aspect of your data SecOps operations and really helps companies implement those security controls much faster because it's um, detached from um, the rest of their operation. Nice, Thought, leaning into that simplicity trend that you talked about. Okay, guys, that's all the time we have today. Really thank, thank want to thank Ben and Yoav for, for coming on theCUBE. It was really great to have you. I'd love to welcome you back at uh, some point. Thank you, Dave. All right, remember Thanks, these episodes. These episodes are all available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Check out ETR's website at etr.ai. We also publish a full report every week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. You can get in touch with me, email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com, at dvellante, or comment on our LinkedIn post. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights, powered by ETR. Have a great week, stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.